The surface preparation process is developed usually in a product evaluation phase to evaluate how wettable the surface is. And that, that can begin with a visual inspection to look for any signs of gross contamination. And without quantifying anything, you can visually inspect how easily a drop of water either beads up or fully wets the surface. In general, coatings, paints, and adhesives all wet to a product similar to how water wets a surface. And Bob Willis has a nice video on YouTube describing how to evaluate surface cleanliness through what's called a water break test which has uh, very similar principles to see how wettable the surface is and if there's any de-wetting present uh, that can indicate the overall state of cleanliness. And another thing to note is it's called the appearance of the solder mask, since it can indicate how difficult it may be for any coating to stick to it. That's my guest, Dr. Sean Clancy, next on Reliability Matters. Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. Dr. Sean Clancy has a Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry from the University of North Florida and a PhD in Chemistry from the University of Southern California. Dr. Sean Clancy has experience in root cause failure analysis of electronic components, wire bonds, epoxy glass fiber composites for bare boards, through hole technology, and surface mount technology assemblies, as well as soldering, cleaning, conformal coating, and other electronic manufacturing processes for aerospace, automotive, commercial, defense, industrial, medical device, and scientific instrument customers. He has authored 19 publications, including four co-authored publications and two patent applications, and presented a variety of technical subjects to audiences at local, regional, and international events, including IPC, MRS, SMTA, SPIE, universities, and other venues. Dr. Clancy is Director of Coding Technology at HZO, a manufacturer of coding equipment and a provider of various coding services, including paraline coatings, plasma applied nano coatings, plasma enhanced paraline, multi-layer material coating applications, atomic layer deposition, hybrid coatings, and more. Here's my conversation with Dr. Sean Clancy about all things coating. Sean Clancy, welcome to Reliability Matters. I appreciate you being my guest today. Hi, Mike. It's my pleasure to be your guest today. Before we dive into uh, conformal coating and coatings in general, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, your company, HZO. Um, tell me about the origins of the company and, and the, market, uh, the markets that it serves and the pro types of general products that it produces. Uh, so as technology evolves, products and devices, especially consumer electronics, get smaller, more complex, and more portable. And with this new mobility and device complexity comes never before experienced exposure to a wider variety of environments. And this can include rain, sweat, sea air, corrosive gases, and more, which threaten the sensitive electronics inside these expensive and necessary devices. So we recognize that the available protection options, things like seals, gaskets, heavy and thick conformal coatings, had significant drawbacks, especially for this new generation of electronics. So we developed the HCO Spectrum of Protection, which is a portfolio of thin film conformal coatings and nano coatings, specifically engineered to protect today's and tomorrow's electronic products. And this Spectrum of Protection was designed to be applied during the manufacturing process, enabling the specific protection any given device and company required. And since our founding in 2011, HCO has been protecting electronics around the world from the most demanding environments with superior nano coatings. This is accomplished through custom tailored solutions to meet customer requirements in every field from consumer electronics to IoT, automotive to health, and others to deliver a better, more reliable, water-resistant, and waterproof product. 
And our, for our customers, this reduces costly returns and improves customer satisfaction and retention. We're protecting electronic devices from the inside out, regardless of the environment. So, Sean, as I see it, there are, there are two methods of preventing water or whatever other bad actors uh, from damaging the product. Either, either build a wall, you know, uh, encase the, um, the subject product uh, in a fortress and not allow material to get in, or just uh, concede that we're going to lose that battle over time and know that bad actors are going to get in and, uh, and protect the actual target, protect the, the sensitive product. Um, are there advantages or disadvantages, pros and cons to either of those methods? Uh, yeah, I think there's both uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the first strategy of presenting the undesirable material from entering the product usually involves gaskets. So historically, gaskets have worked reasonably well for some products, uh, mainly through the design of the product's enclosure or housing, and they can be relatively cheap. Um, there are a few downsides to gaskets in, in that they can pop up, in, uh, including uh, gaskets becoming dislodged, swelling, or breaking uh, when the product's housing undergoes any type of mechanical, chemical, or thermal stress, such as when the product is dropped, uh, exposed to incompatible solvents, or even with the thermal cycling of repeated hot, cold, hot, cold extremes. Eventually the gasket will fail and then the components inside are prone to whatever gets through the breach. So gasket sealed products also have to account for any inherent pressure differentials with either relative humidity, water immersion, corrosive gases, etc. So nature's driving towards equilibrium. So when you have a pressure difference, gas or liquids want to push through from a high to a low level until both sides are equal. So uh, with water, other corrosives can then be trapped inside a housing that uses gaskets at that point and start corroding the electronics. And with the second strategy is coating the circuit assemblies inside the product with a protective coating. Uh, with this method, it's not as much of an issue when water or other materials get in the product's housing, since the assemblies inside are protected with a strong barrier coating. Some housing designs can even allow water to move in and out easily to prevent a pressure gradient uh, from forming and then allow for any corrosive materials to drain away more easily. So when planning for protective coatings, you have to consider where you want the coating to be or not be, uh, which is generally handled through masking and demasking processes. And also you should consider how and where your customers will use the product, uh, what temperatures it'll experience, uh, how much direct sunlight, does it need to be halogen free and et cetera. One anecdote, uh, just the other day I was in my pool and mm -hmm. my, I have an, you know, the, the most recent iPhone, I'm just, you know, I'm a technology geek, so I, I'm not <laughs> the guy that stands in line, but I pre-order. Um, so um, th that particular model, the iPhone 11 Max Pro Turbo, what, whatever they call it, now, <laughs> uh, is, uh, it has a water rating, a water, water resistance rating. So it can supposedly go down to, you know, 30 feet for a few minutes and, and be okay. The, the interesting thing is I, I never have dropped it in the water, but sometimes it sits close to the edge of the pool and the grandkids come over and they splash and, and sometimes it gets wet. Every time that happens, I can't charge my phone for a good 10 hours because mm -hmm. when I plug in the, the charging cable, it says there's moisture detected in the, in the uh, you know, charging cable um, that could hurt your phone. So we're not going to let you charge it until it com it's completely gone. <laughs> so... Mm -hmm. Yes, it can survive a drop in the water, but clearly their approach, at least to that part of the, of the phone, was to allow ingress of, of fluids and just, you know, through software, um, just shut off a certain uh, feature of the phone, charging. So not quite as water resistant as I had hoped. I guess it, it, it's enough to prevent me from having to buy a new phone but it's not enough where the phone will 
continue to function properly if if it's subjected to moisture at least for a period of time. It's like a it's almost like a timeout, you know. It uh, it it's so it's not quite as waterproof as one thinks um, from that standpoint. So let's talk about, you talked about different types of coatings. You use the, the term thin film and nano coating. Let's walk me through the different types of coatings. We'll get into the, the actual materials like acrylics and perylenes and stuff in a moment. But in terms of the, the, the basic um, like application methods or, or types, tell me the difference between a thin, thin film and a nano coating, which to me is like an ultra thin film, uh, and, and a, a regular um, uh, everyday type conformal coating material. Um, what are the differences? What types of products are they used for? The differences are that the traditional and the nano coatings is, is a combination of thickness, as the term nano implies nanometer scale thickness, as well as material selection, its deposition method and cure mechanism. And for traditional conformal coatings, it's thicknesses, let's say, ranging from 25 microns or a mil to even hundreds of microns or even millimeters in some cases. And those include acrylics, epoxies, silicones, urethanes, and which can be deposited through spray, dip, dispense, and selective dispense. And those are cured through ambient moisture, heat, UV light, or a combination of all these. Um, and since they start out as liquids, they're dispersed or dispersed in a solvent. The overall thickness of the coating is dependent upon its viscosity, how concentrated it is, and how fast material can cure. So generally, gravity pulls the coating down and leaves thinner coverage at the top of the component leads on sidewalls and other tall features. And so traditional coatings have solvents and exposure hazards that need to be managed and those curing processes can range from seconds for like uv cure or for like moisture cure things can take up to weeks to achieve a full cure so you need to plan on managing you know floor space proper environmental conditions and how to handle as the, these products in the work in progress stage uh, perylenes um, can be deposited in thicknesses ranging from uh, nanometers to uh, 50 microns, potentially even more. Uh, IPC mill NASA specs call for thicknesses ranging from 12 and a half to up to 50 microns. Um, but um, compared to traditional coatings, perylenes are deposited through what's called a chemical vapor deposition or CVD polymerization process where products is placed in a deposition chamber and the perylene precursor material, which most of the time is called a dimer, is a powder that's loaded into another part of the system called a vaporizer or sublimer. And the whole system is pumped down under vacuum. Uh, dimer is then heated and sublimes from a solid to a gas and is pulled by the vacuum through a heated zone called a pyrolyzer or pyro. And that pyro cracks or splits the dimer into two active monomers that enter the deposition chamber, which is around room temperature and coats everything in the chamber. So the good thing about perylene is that it coats everything. The challenging thing about perylene is that it coats everything. So for perylene and other low vacuum CVD coatings, you know, buttons, switches, and even the masking agents you use need to be able to handle the vacuum process. And for nearly all coating types, you have to mass connectors, test points, and grounding pads to allow for the easy removal of that dielectric coating and allow for electrical conductivity and connectivity. And these masks can include a plug, cap, tape, glue, et cetera, to cover areas where you don't want the coating to stay. And after the coating process, the masking material along with the coating in that area is removed altogether. So we've developed methods to use, uh, uh, to remove perylene from the unmasked areas, either use uh, plasma ashing or etching processes, uh, laser ablation or a combination of the two. Uh, these methods are dependent on product design and 
may require customization for certain applications and production volumes. And besides depositing, depositing uh, perylene in the nanometer range, we're also developing uh, plasma polymer, uh, ALD, and other types of coatings that have target thicknesses well under a micron. So depending on the connector type, the level of protection required, the product design, uh, masking may not be required for coatings in that thickness range and may be considered what's called connect through. So, we, you know, you talk about uh, the different types of coatings um, from acrylics up, up to perylenes and, and the application methods. You also mentioned uh, viscosity. So viscosity, I, I, I guess, serves, you know, both as a nemesis and as an advantage to a process. I, and I'm not an expert, obviously, on conformal coating, which is why you're on that end of the microphone <laughs> and I'm on this end. But the, from common sense would tell me that if you have too high a viscosity, uh, you'll get you'll get thicker coatings at the top. You don't you know gravity has uh, slightly less effect, but you may not you may not get underneath the component or completely seal down at the lower areas. And if you have too low a viscosity, then you'll have really thin layers at the top and and thicker layers at the bottom. Is that is that a, a, a correct assessment? Yes. So perylene, due to its its um, application method, it's not sprayed on as you mentioned. Uh, does that give someone more control over a, a uniform uh, thickness? Yes, it coats everywhere evenly. Okay. I mean, th there might be very slight differences depending on if you're inhibiting like gas flow or and things like that, but it it will wrap around every part to a, very close to the same thickness all, everywhere in the chamber. Mm -hmm. So Sean, this may be an, an ignorant question here, uh, but I've always wondered this: when when a circuit assembly is coated, uh, is there any effect on heat dissipation? Uh, if, if, particularly if this assembly runs hot, uh, does that provide any advantage disadvantage? Uh, what what are the thermal uh, transfer rate differences between an uncoated board and a coated board? Uh, there can be minor uh, differences, especially with uh, the very thin coatings. It's much more of a problem when you get to thicker coatings and uh, uh, things that are form both dielectric and thermal barriers. Um, but for, typically for the thinner coatings in the terms of microns or even sometimes up to tens of microns, it may not be an issue at all. You and I both have been over the years to the Cleaning and Coating Conference, which is a joint uh, production between IPC and SMTA, and it every two years in the Chicago area. And um, the, one of the first, I think it was the very first one, which was, I don't know, eight or 10 years ago, uh, you know, there's all these speakers talking about cleaning and coating and all the best practices to get the coating to stay on the assembly and, and a lot of things that we're talking about here. And then one, uh, I think we had an expert panel come up and uh, there were questions asked and answered. And then someone asked, how do you remove conformal coating? And, and that totally took over the whole conversation. That became the, <laughs> the, the most popular question in, in three days of how to put it on was this one guy that went, well, you know, what if we need to take it off? And, and what was apparent way back then was there wasn't a lot of good solutions presented. It was basically, you know, put it in this really toxic chemical and have it dissolve or put it in a sandblasting machine and micro abrasion it off. And, and both seemed um, very uh, prehistoric. And in, in terms of their methods, uh, compared to all the technology about applying it, taking it off seemed very prehistoric. So tell me about conformal coating removal or coating removal in general. Is, has, that, has that progressed? Has that become easier and, and a little less prehistoric over the last several years? I would say yes, it, it has become less prehistoric, and, but still people like to say that perylenes are impossible to rework. And that's just not true. Um, it does have excellent chemical resistance. So I agree, you can't use the 
solvent method you described to dissolve it and strip it off. But you can uh, remove it using microblast abrasion, which you just mentioned. And that can include a variety of blast media, even crushed dry ice. So if you want to use crushed dry ice, you just have to be careful around any components that are sensitive to thermal shock. And a skilled assembler or rework specialist can perform this with a manual system and automated systems, I believe, are available as well. And you can remove it, uh, perilines through laser ablation systems at a variety of wavelengths and types, including excimer and CO2 lasers. Even CO2 lasers found in the laser cutting and etching tools that are available for it's called maker use um, can work well. Work well. Uh, one of the major efforts in that technique, though, is ensuring that you've aligned the laser over the appropriate areas. So it's good to have an automated optical inspection like visual system in place. And laser ablation works best on flat surfaces such as ground pads and test points. And uh, another technique is called plasma ashing or etching. Here you have areas on your assemblies where you want to remove the coating exposed to a plasma composed of oxygen or a combination of gases. And over time, the plasma exposed areas uh, cause the coating to etch away. And uh, plasma ashing can work uh, for flat and three-dimensional features, including ground pads, shield cans, and many types of connectors. Um, the, I'd like to say though that many nanometer thick coated coatings can just be soldered through. So you can, there are opportunities for desoldering a component Resoldering it, cleaning or preparing the area, and just recoding. Excellent. So it sounds like uh, we have left the prehistoric age and come into modern time uh, with uh, <laughs> with laser and other more automated uh, versions of that laser laser plasma things like that. Excellent. Well, I, I'm glad to hear that um, you know we don't need the uh, hammer and chisel you know to, <laughs> to take the material off. I guess it that's the challenge of Paraline. Uh, it is so well known for for um, adherence and, uh, or uh, adhesion, I should say, uh, that you spend all your effort convincing people how good it is for adhesion and how robust it is uh, to protect against uh, harsh environments. Uh, and that goes against you when, when you have to rework it, right? So it can't be right. that, you can't say, oh no, just peel it off. <laughs> so you can't have both. Uh, but I guess the, the most, more important attribute is uh, is not removal. The more important attribute is that it stays in place and protects. I, if I were to have only one attribute to choose from, it would have to be that, not removal. Right. Right. I mean, the rework process is important for like the uh, aerospace defense type boards that might cost upwards of ten grand or more for per board, or you have a specialized processor that might be you know, three to 5k on it or something. So right. if you want to replace that or replace something else on the board, then rework is very important. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's all, all a matter of cost and availability, particularly on those old military boards where a lot of those boards are obsolete and they're only repaired. They're not made anymore. There are contract manufacturers and OEMs that do their own conformal coating in house. Um, I, I've seen it. You, you know when you're getting near that part of the uh, assembly process because you can smell it. It's it's <laughs> pretty pretty uh, pretty nauseous. Uh, is is paraline coating more typically done through a paraline coating contractor, or is it frequently or uh, you know seldom done on the factory floor uh, at the OEM or the contract manufacturer? We've actually had the most experience being installed at the contract manufacturer. And we have several different, let's say, business models slash methods of how the customer wants to interact um, with the coding process. So um, either we can behave similar to a contra or contract coder where you send your parts off code and we ship them back. But the most products that we've code have been had the systems installed somewhere in the contract manufacturer's facility. And so after the boards come off the reflow line, they get um, 
hand it off to us. We mask, coat, demask, inspect, and hand it hand it back to the contract manufacturer to finish the final assembly. In a paneling world, I, I talked about in the spray application, you have to have really good air ventilation because the, the smell is, is pretty severe. In a paneling world, because this process is done inside of a chamber, is the odor a little bit more controlled? Uh, there's practically no odor. I mean, there is a exhaust uh, connection for the systems, and that's mainly because the vacuum pumps themselves are vented uh, and uh, out of the building. Um, but there's very little, if any, smell associated with the process. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So, in our world, in the cleaning world, you know, we we clean two things. We clean circuit assemblies post reflow and we clean stencils that are used to apply the solder paste to the to the bare board and the stencils require cleaning two types of cleaning they require usually in process cleaning which is just an under wipe in the stencil printer uh, machine and when the production run is done the stencils are taken offline and cleaned in a stencil cleaner or manually cleaned uh, there's been a lot of talk uh, about nano coatings on stencils that can either be applied by the stencil manufacturer or reapplied by the by the stencil owner in use. Um, what types of advantages do nano coatings provide on uh, stencils? And uh, is it a gimmick? Is it real? Uh, does it wear off because stencils are cleaned all the time? Does that affect the nano coating? Do you have any experience in that uh, particular segment of the market? I've read up on that. And most of the coatings are uh, reasonably uh, robust. It, it, it really depends on the coating, but the whole point is to help make sure you have the solder paste um, go through the uh, apertures in the stencil and release the way you want it to, so you don't have any blockages and continuous or good uh, solder paste transfer over uh, many assemblies. <laughs> And there are coatings that can withstand the whole white process for, I, I don't know, I would probably say several hours or to days, but there are, I've read up on, there are some products that claim to last for weeks to months. Um, it's just a lot of, uh, how, let's say, both managing hydrophobic, oleophobic, and uh, wear resistant or abrasion resistant those coatings are. Here's another uh, anecdote. I was, uh, every once in a while I get my car detailed. They come to my office. And my detailer uh, offered me a special package. It was $1,500. And <laughs> he promised me that it, the car would not need another detail for three years, just a wash here and there, and uh, which, which made me understand how, why he wants to charge me so much because he's not going to be back for, for a while. And right. he was um, not knowing what industry I'm in. Uh, he, he was explaining the marvels of this brand new uh, science, uh, scientific um, achievement in car waxes called nano coating. <laughs> and and um, he would apply a special nano coating, which is super expensive, and it's $1,500, uh, and um, you know, all these advantages of this nano coating. And then, so I, I chuckled a little bit and I said, no thanks, it, that's, that's fine, just regular detail, thank you. And then the next time I went to the auto supply store for something, I saw like turtle wax with nano coating and, and uh, all these different brand MacGyvers with nano coating, and you know, it's just, it's almost become a, um, in the consumer world anyway, it's, it's just kind of become a, a fancy name. You know, I, I don't really understand if there's truly a nano coating technology in those consumer products or if it's just, uh, you know, one molecule of something so, that, so they could say it's there. Um, but in the real world of, of nano coating, um, I, I would assume that a nano coating is used when a traditional uh, other type of coating material would be too thick, um, or um, if uh, a material is maybe pliable 
Uh, is, is that where nano coatings kind of have their, their advantage? Yes. It's, it's more where you want to have either water wick or roll away, or if you need a, an oxygen barrier along with just blocking water ingress, and you can even coat, uh, devices at different stages, such as at the component level, bare board or full assemblies. It really depends on what you want to achieve. And especially for legacy products, what failure modes were most common. Um, which can help direct which protection methods work best to, to improve reliability and in turn customer satisfaction. One of your customers was Nike. It talked about on your website. HCO was with Nike when they launched the fuel band wearable. Ah, so okay. Back to electronics. Code, yeah, it, uh, most of the uh, products we have have been related to circuit assemblies and related mm-hmm. devices, but we're branching out to other applications as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Besides some wearables, we coat e-readers, tablets, earbuds, headphones, uh, ruggedizing tablets. We've also coated things like concussion sensors and fall detectors, um, smart home devices, and LED displays and billboards as well. Yeah, very good. I, going to the, back to the subject of IOT, People in my audience has heard me kind of rail um, <laughs> kind of against this whole concept of IoT, which, which is, you know, putting, uh, connecting de- uh, consumer devices just because we can, not because there's a market for it. And the example I always give is like the connected toothbrush, which is, which is a real thing. Um, your toothbrush can be connected to your Wi-Fi, which could tell uh, the parent of little Susie or Johnny is brushing their teeth for how long, how vigorous, et cetera. Uh, but, but the... The expansion of IoT, and I'm a geek, so I, I do enjoy all these, um, you know, the, these connected electrified you know, devices. But the, you know, one of the things about cheap consumer devices now being able to connect to the internet um, means that we're taking these kind of low cost class one devices and throwing them into harsh environments. You know, uh, wearables are, are that way. Even if it's just a little light up button that you can w- pin to your jacket um you know there's electronics in there and and it's not a class three device nobody dies if they fail but the products are now coming with us because we we use iot and we take it with us or we we take it outside and and i see now a lot of failures because because it's not a class three device they're generally not cleaning it's usually no clean uh it probably isn't coated or coated well usually it's just you know, uh, ingress uh, protection, and these devices are failing, and it's uh, it's a harsh environment world out there, and circuit boards don't like harsh environments. So, I, I do see how IoT is uh, potentially increasing the coding uh, industry's uh, business because without proper coding, that stuff just doesn't survive when it's attached to a human or follows a human around. We go to we go to scary places. So um, I, I think that's, um, that's certainly a challenge that the industry has to solve, which is to be able to take kind of low cost class one type devices and still make them reliable, not to save lives, but just, you know, to save reputation and, and replacement costs. And part of the success of any conformal coating uh, is surface preparation. I don't know if you, uh, I, I think I might be older than you, but there was a a car painting establishment. I think they're still around called Earl Scheib. You heard of them? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So back when I was a kid, there were television commercials uh, that, that where Earl Scheib would, would stand in front of the camera and say, I'll paint any car for twenty nine ninety five. And even back then that was cheap. Right. So it's like, how can you possibly paint an entire car for less than $30? And the, the, uh, the joke was that, you know, if you pick the wrong color and you had, uh, buyer's remorse, don't worry, because within three months, the paint's all going to peel off anyway. Because <laughs> for $30, you wash your own car, bring it in clean. There was no surface preparation at all. Uh, and so any any coating, any painting, any adhesion process requires good surface preparation. What, what, types of, what type of advice do you give to your customers uh, when they want you to coat something or they want to purchase your equipment to coat something. Uh, what's the best practice? Let's go back to electronic assemblies. Uh, what's the best practice for surface preparation? 
Well, there's a couple different ways to go about it. So surface preparation process is developed usually in a product evaluation phase to evaluate how wettable the surface is. And that, that can begin with a visual inspection to look for any signs of gross contamination. And without quantifying anything, you can visually inspect how easily a drop of water either beads up or fully wets the surface. In general, coatings, paints, and adhesives all wet to a product similar to how water wets a surface. And Bob Willis has a nice video on YouTube describing how to evaluate surface cleanliness through what's called a water break test which has uh, very similar principles to see how wettable a surface is and if there's any de-wetting present uh, that can indicate the overall state of cleanliness. And another thing to note is it's called the appearance of the solder mask, since it can indicate how difficult it may be for any coating to stick to it. The shinier the solder mask, it usually means it's glassier and smoother. And this is great for preventing flux and flux residue from bridging when they're used in adequate amounts, uh, but can be problematic when you want to use it uh, something after soldering to have it stick to it. In contrast, matte solder masks are usually easier to adhere to. And plasma treatment with argon and oxygen can improve wettability by introducing micro roughness with the argon and oxygen can provide a small amount of oxidation to add chemical groups to bond to. And I've heard of some cases in industry where plasma treatment wasn't able to improve the excessively cured or glassy solder mass. So those assemblies had to be scrapped and either uh, another solder mask had to be specified or the bare board manufacturer had to modify their solder mask cure process. With plasma treatment, it's kind of like a microscopic chemical Velcro. You're, you're really creating a rough surface so that uh, the coating material digs in a little bit and, and digs in, digs under the, the pores and the, the, the micro little craters created by roughing up the surface, right? Correct. And the more hydrophobic the surface is prior to coating, the more difficult it will be for uh, items to stick to it. So um, you can quantify the surface energy by using either dime pens for estimating surface energy ranges or using a water contact angle measurement tool to see if the surface is hydrophilic or water loving and it means it has an angle below 90 degrees mm -hmm. or hydrophobic which means water fearing and has an angle above 90 degrees so both methods use the same principles so the dyne pens have inks with a range of surface energies where you swipe the pen across the surface and you observe the ink to see if it stays as a coherent stripe or if it starts beating up. And the contact angle tool is usually a camera, a light source, and a flat surface between the two. And you use a syringe to drop a small drop of water or other fluid on there. And you focus on the drop of water and essentially take a photo and then you use the software to measure the angle on the sides of the water droplet to see if it's hydrophilic or hydrophobic. Yeah, one of our uh, prior guests on this show um, worked for BTG Labs, and they make a handheld, kind of a, a large gun-shaped device that um, will uh, do contact angle measurement kind of right there on the fly um, on various products to measure the surface energy of the product. Um, and, but I know those things can also be done manually as you're with dine pens and things like that. Uh, for some people, they think there's an advantage. There may be an advantage in having it more automated uh, so that the tests are more repeatable and less subjective. Uh, and, and others, um, you know, have no problem having their people do it manually and, and um, you know, interpret the results themselves. I guess it all depends on budget and quantity and things like that. But, you know, as a general rule, I think you're right. The, the, um, the cleaner the product, uh, the more adherable the surface will be. Is there any advantage uh, to different coating materials in terms of cleanliness requirements? Does perylene, because it's it's applied in a in a machine under vacuum, does that um, give you you know a little bit of a, a pass in terms of cleanliness, or does it do all uh, surfaces need to be um, just as clean regardless of what type of coating material is going to be applied? 
It really depends on how clean and reliable and robust your product needs to be in the long run. Um, for any coating, it, you're, it's ideal that you start with a clean, dry surface and that the boards are kept dry before coating and adhesion and, uh, and long-term performance can be enhanced with plasma treatment and the use of primers. Um, but really you should, uh, if you have your process tightly controlled all the way, you know, back to c component selection, solder paste application, reflow, and general state of cleanliness, it's beneficial to all parties, uh, customer, CM, coder, and even end user. And even uh, if cleaning isn't an option and you absolutely have to use a no clean process, then minimizing the amount of flex residue and any other handling contamination can be acceptable for general use or consumer electronic devices. We've had a, a lot of uh, good performance with just uh, our general processes of uh, ensuring good surface prep and perylene and not having to do a, a uh, full clean. Yeah, uh, I think cleaning is best practice, but it's not always possible. And so one of the advice, one of the bits of advice we give to our customers, um, now, you know, we live in a cleaning world, so we're like, you know, Maslow's law, you know, if all you have is a hammer, the whole world <laughs> is a bed of nails. You know, we see everything as contamination. But if, but the reality is some people just don't want to or can't clean um, prior to coating. So we tell them to bake. You mentioned uh, dry. What a lot of people don't realize is when you're, you know, they think when they coat, they're sealing out you know, harmful things, uh, right. but they are also sealing in potentially harmful things. So, you know, we, I, I had experience, my audience has heard this story probably too many times, but I was um, hired as an expert witness in a uh, civil lawsuit between an OEM and a contract manufacturer. And basically the OEM sued the contract manufacturer by doing exactly what the contract, what, what the OEM said to do. And when the product failed, they said, well, you should have known that we were wrong. <laughs> you know, so, but one of the things they were doing was, <laughs> was um, uh, not coding technically. They, well, I guess technically it's coding. They were, they were um, encasing their product in silicone, probably about a, an inch of silicone all the way around. And, uh, and then throwing these products into the ground. And r they ran the products off a battery, a 10 year battery, which turned out to be a six month battery because they had a lot of electrical leakage. They had um, uh, CAF, which is a subterranean uh, ECM issue uh, between the layers of the board. And they also had dendritic growth and parasitic leakage on the surface of the board. And they couldn't figure out why, because they had coated, not only coated the board, they had put it in this, this completely protective surrounding of silicone. And, you know, it turns out they didn't clean, you know, mistake number one, but the biggest mistake is they didn't bake. So they had all the ingredients for electrochemical migration already within the package. And had they not coated it, one can argue that moisture may have outgassed and, and you know, not caused the problems that, that they, they actually experienced. But um, so I think when, when, the, when people ask me, should I clean? Of course, yes. But, but also consider you're not cleaning just for adhesion, you're also cleaning to make sure that you're not trapping in all the ingredients that are required for electrochemical migration failure mechanisms to occur. Um, because we are trapping in all the bad actors. And it's good to get the bad actors off the island before we coat the island. You know, I think that's the, the, that's the advice that we give. Well, if, if someone says, okay, HCO, I, I want to either buy your products or have you coat stuff for me. Uh, what types of questions do you ask or what types of questions do you recommend your customers ask when considering a coating process? Generally, they should ask about the experience the supplier has with that type of product and how it will use. They should ask about the scalability of their coating process and if they can meet the expected number of samples that need to be coated with the desired throughput, either per day, per week, per month, etc. cetera. Uh, the supplier will likely ask the customer about the design and complexity of their product, which would need to be evaluated for the number and type of, it's called coding keep out regions or masking points, which can include 
connectors, test points, ground pads, etc. And the supplier will also need to know the you know, expected in-use environment, the level of protection required, whether the customer only needs coding or if they required a solution that involves masking, coding, and demasking. Excellent. Let's kind of end on this uh, kind of negative note. Uh, I find that when we talk about best practices, people listen. When we talk about uh, common mistakes, more people listen. Everyone likes, you know, misery loves company. What are, mm -hmm. uh, in your experience in this industry, uh, what are some of the classic mistakes that you've seen people make uh, when, um, when coding or, or considering coding? And any good, you know, horror stories from the field? No names. <laughs> we don't <laughs> want you to lose customers. But, uh, well, let me back up a little bit. One of my favorite things is back in the day when we could travel and we were going to trade shows and things like that, you know, back in the normal days, quite frequently after the show, we'll go out to dinner and end up in a bar and we'll talk to, you know, all the other people in our industry. We'll, we'll kind of gather around and, and we all compare stories like these, you know, the, the horror stories. And, uh, and everyone has a better story than the next guy. And, <laughs> and, and we, we commiserate with that. I'll, I'll, I'll start with this story. Uh, one of the products we make are ionic contamination testers, rose testers, which basically have this super, super, super clean extraction solution, 150 million ohm electrical resistance uh, in the solution. And the board is put into this solution and the board is dirtier than the solution. So contaminants, uh, residues are, are extracted from the board and that changes the electrical resistivity of the test solution. So the resist resistivity starts to drop and then we, we determine from that amount of the drop and other things how dirty the board was. So we had a customer, uh, this is way back probably 30 years ago, 25, 28 years ago, somewhere around there, where I was, it was, we, we were a young company, you know, I was doing like everything, chief cook and bottle washer. So I had a customer that said, you know, our boards are all failing. It was a big military contract and our boards are all failing. And I, I flew to Florida, which is where they were, to, um, to witness the process because we couldn't figure out what was wrong by diagnosing it over the phone. So I, I said, just run a test, show me, I just want to see, I want to be a fly on the wall. Show me, I'm not going to get involved. I just want to see you run a test because I couldn't find anything wrong with the machine. So he's ready to, he's cleaned the board, now he's ready to test it. And the tank is of extraction solutions about 18 inches deep. And his board was only about four by four inches. So he didn't want to drop the board from the top of the tank down to the bottom. <laughs> so all of a sudden I see him unbuttoning his sleeve and rolling, slowly rolling the sleeve up, oh. up his arm. And I'm <laughs> thinking, no, 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 no. I just flew 3,000 miles. No, no, no. And, of course, he, he puts his arm, holding the board, all the way down to the bottom of the test cell, lets the board go, takes his arm off, shakes the test solution off his arm, and runs the test. And his employees were all standing around. So I'm like, oh, no. I, how, do you, how, do you, how do you tell this guy he's wrong in front of all his staff, you know, tactfully? So... Anyway, we just did it, and I said, oh, we, we know how clean your arm is. You know, your arm doesn't pass, you know, mill standard cleanliness <laughs> at the time. Um, so that was my, one of my favorite stories. Um, any, anything hit your desk where your engineers uh, come up to you and go, hey, Sean, we can't figure this out. Help us out here. Here's what this guy's doing. Uh, well, I would say in general, the most common mistakes when uh, is expecting a coding to undo your past mistakes. <laughs> so applying a coating to a product can make a difference in the long-term reliability and usability, but it's not the first line of defense. And the first step in preventing reliability issues is making sure that your product has been properly designed, stored, and cleaned before a coating is even considered. In other words, you shouldn't assume that a coating would cover a multitude of sins. Coding makes sure the process doesn't get any worse or the, the results don't get any worse. It doesn't make it better. Right. And it's uh, like you mentioned with the silicone uh, potting product. Uh, silicone is 
decent or depends on the silicone, but they're decent at blocking out bulk water, but like molecular water can get through silicones reasonably quickly and you can end up having a puddle under your coating, you know, in short, short time. So if you have any of ionic residues or anything, uh, on your board before potting, you're going to end up having dendritic failure. And um, years ago, when I worked at the EMPF, where I believe we we first met. Yeah, um, that was a long time ago. <laughs> I, I did a lot of uh, failure analysis work. And one of the products that came in was a uh, sensor from an oil rig out in the ocean. And they said, oh, this, this display burned out and we failed, you know, what's going on? And, and you start looking at it and oh, it's like, oh, it's got a coating on it. And you, you, it's like, uh, start looking behind on the backside of the board. It's like the coating is delaminating everywhere. I see a partial fingerprint. There's dendritic growth between most of the pins. And, and it's just like, uh, so if I had access to CODIS, I could tell you who touched the board before, before coding. <laughs> My favorite thing about the EMPF was uh, Jim Raby and his, uh, his beloved uh, 6336, you know, weapons standard, weapon spec. And uh, the, the line where he, he would say, uh, this is the way you have to do it. And if you do it any other way, it's subject to review and disapproval. <laughs> Those were actually the words that were in the standard. <laughs> So it's like, hey, yeah, no problem. Yeah, you come up with a better idea, but it's subject to disapproval. So I used to really enjoy that. Yeah, the MPF was um, was a real uh, valuable um, tool for manufacturers of equipment to get a a very unbiased and very um, um, tough review of your products. Uh, it, it wasn't enough to say what they did. They they you had to provide products, send them into the desert, and uh, have them actually reviewed by probably folks like yourself, you know, th who knew what they were doing. Um, the current EMPF in Philadelphia, I think the or whatever they call themselves now, a little bit different. Um, I think they still do a lot of good work there, but um, it it certainly ba it doesn't compare to the days uh, when connected to China Lake and, and California in the desert and um, really had a lot of clout back in those days. Yeah, I worked at one there in Philadelphia and uh, I came to them though after I did my postdoc at China Lake. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you got to serve your time in the desert. So does, uh, quite literally in this case, right? <laughs> oh, I hardly ever went over 120 back then. I know, right? Uh, just the other day, Death Valley, which is kind of near there, um, was 130 degrees, hottest place on earth. It set a record. And yeah. You think about it. 100 degrees is awfully hot. That's 30 degrees higher than that. That's crazy. But that's why they call it Death Valley. That's why it's a desert, right? Well, yeah. yeah. And I remember, you know, leaving the, the buildings, going to the parking lot, and it's like, oh, it's 100 degrees. So I can handle this. And it's 110. Uh, this isn't great. Then it's 120. You better get to the car quick. and Get to the car, turn on the know. air conditioner, go to the mall, <laughs> well, whatever it takes. Well, yeah. yeah. Get the windows down so you don't bake in the car. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 120 outside is like almost 200 inside. So, yeah. Sean, thank you very much for being my guest. Uh, you're, you're a resource of information. I really appreciate it. If someone wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way? Uh, you can reach me uh, at uh, HCO either through email uh, or uh, just calling HCO's main numbers. Excellent. And uh, for our listeners, I will have uh, Sean's contact information, phone number, email uh, in the show notes. Um, so you can go to Spreaker, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com uh, under Reliability Matters and look at the um, episode for uh, Sean. And uh, we will have that information right there. So, Sean, thanks again for being my guest. Uh, you're, a, you're a wealth of knowledge. And I appreciate um, all the uh, information you're providing. And uh, I wish you um, uh, safety and health uh, as we move forward through this pandemic. Hopefully we're closer to the end of it than we are the beginning of it. Thank you, Mike. I enjoyed speaking with you today, too. All right. Take care, Sean. You too. Well, that's another episode. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Don't miss an episode. 
Subscribe to Reliability Matters on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. A special thanks to Circuits Assembly Magazine and Ascendo Reliability for syndicating this show and where you can listen to this and other interesting podcasts on pcbchat.com and reliability.fm. Thanks for your questions and episode suggestions. Please keep them coming. Send comments to mike at mikeconrad.com. That's Conrad with a K. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode of Reliability Matters. Once again, thanks for listening and keep doing it right. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters.